May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. When uh, I was in school many, 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 many years ago, I uh, always wanted to be out of school. I always envied those who were working and making money. And one reason why I wanted to get out of school was because I didn't like exams. And uh, as I look at all the young people here, uh, there's a shock on your face. You don't like exams? No, I didn't. I know your faces are telling me, bring it on, bring it on, right? All of you are A-grade students. I didn't fall into that category. So when I became a Christian, I suddenly realized there is one school from which I cannot bail out. And that's called the school of faith. And uh, that's the subject I want to uh, present to you this morning. And I would encourage you to take notes uh, because there are a lot of things here that you will have to process uh, when you get back home. The school of faith. The first point we want to look at is the gift of faith. The gift of faith. None of us are born with faith. And so look at this verse, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, all of us know that this is one of the most foundational gospel verses in the Bible. And if we are to come into a right relationship with God, it does not happen because of the good works that we engage in. Just look at all the religions around you. Today is a big day for the Muslims. Hajj. Millions, millions all over the world observing this religious uh, feast. And uh, it's all works-based works base but when it comes to christianity it is purely by the grace of god and our choice to exercise faith in what the lord jesus christ did for us on the cross so in heaven no one is going to blow his horn no one is going to boast we are all going to celebrate the grace of god and the gift that God gave us to believe what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. So it was in the 20th year of my life that God gave me the gift of faith to believe what the Lord Jesus Christ personally did for me at the cross. So you enter into the school of faith by appropriating the gift of faith. As you keep looking at this uh, subject, Romans 12 verse 3 says, in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. <laughs> All of us have been given a measure of faith. So we should not overestimate ourselves, neither should we underestimate ourselves, but we need to look at the faith that God has given us and respond accordingly to God's will, plan, and purpose for our life. 1 Corinthians 12, 9, to another, faith by the same Spirit. The Holy Spirit loves to give gifts to the church. And one of the most precious gifts that the Holy Spirit has given to the church is the gift of faith. And it's with the gift of faith that we are able to do exploits for God. So point number one is the gift of faith. And the question I like to ask you is, have you appropriated that gift for your personal life so that you can enter into a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, the second point we want to look at, by the way, I love alliteration. So everything is the letter G today. And if I bump into you at a Tim Horton, guess what? School of faith, give me the seven G words. And if you can't give it, Brother Daniel, then you have to buy me something from 
Tim Horton, fair deal, brother? Fair deal. The second point is genuine faith. This faith that we claim that we have should be authentic. It should be genuine. The world that we are living in, especially over the last few years, fake news has become very popular, isn't it? Likewise, you can have a fake faith. Yesterday, I bumped into a dear brother, and uh, sadly, he has been uh, separated from his wife, and he told me his story. He said she came from a Hindu background, and before marriage, she went through all the lessons on Christianity, got baptized, and kind of for six years, she went along. And then all of a sudden, one day, boom, she went right back to Hinduism. Six years, she kind of played along uh, with the game called church. So it, that's very troublesome and very frightening because the faith that you say that you have this morning could be fake faith. So we need to have faith that is authentic and genuine. Now look at these two verses. 1 Timothy 1.5, uh, uh, Paul talks about Timothy and he applauds Timothy by saying, Tim, you have sincere faith. I have watched you, I have checked you, and you have the real thing. Your faith is authentic. Now look at the next verse. And all those of you who are parents and grandparents, you've got to listen to this verse very carefully. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. I have been reminded of your sincere faith. Again, looking at Timothy, Paul is saying it. Which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice. Timothy, you have got a genuine faith because there were people who invested in your life. And I really want to applaud all our dear sisters here this morning, mothers and grandmothers. What a massive part they played in a, a spiritual investment in the lives of their children. You know, I attribute my, my Christianity mostly to my mom, a very godly lady, great storyteller. She taught the stories of the Bible and there was a spark in her eyes, excitement in her voice as she narrated these stories to four siblings, all of whom are following the Lord to this day, actively involved in Christian ministry. And that's because there was a mom who invested her time uh, in her children. So moms and grand, uh, grandmothers and grandfathers, please invest in your grandchildren, in your children. That's a huge payoff. That's a huge payoff as you sow that seed and as that seed takes root and it produces fruit and uh, there is going to be birth a Timothy who is going to have authentic, genuine faith. Now point number three. Point number three is the goal of faith. What is the goal of faith? Now I could do a whole sermon on that but I'm going to limit myself to two main goals of faith, one of which we have already explored under point one. The goal of faith is, first of all, your first bullet, saving faith to enter into a personal relationship with God. I mean, think of it. You and I are trusting a person who lived over 2,000 years ago we don't even have a di digital picture of him today. And we are simply staking our all on who that person is and what that person accomplished, the Lord Jesus Christ. That requires enormous faith. And that faith is given to us as a gift by God. Saving faith. Where are you? Enter into the born again experience. You are born from above, you experience a supernatural birth, you become a child of God, you enter into the kingdom of God, you become a child of light. Amazing. 
you receive the gift of forgiveness, you receive the gift of eternal life, saving faith. But it doesn't stop there. Sadly to some, the saving faith becomes stagnant faith. We kind of go through with the spectator mentality, isn't it? We come, we go, but nothing really happening in our life. So that's why the second goal of faith is what I call serving faith. Serving faith. Where by the grace of God and through the exercise of faith, you do exploits for God. That's a key word. Exploits for God. That's another way of saying, what dream do you have for God? Now, as I look at all the young people here, you all have a dream. I want to become a doctor. I want to become an engineer. I want to become a pilot or whatever, right? You have a dream. Spiritually speaking, what dream do you have? What dream do you have for these two, three summer months? I won't betray my age, but I am a senior, a single senior. My beloved wife died two years ago, and uh, I am still actively pursuing young people. We just completed a three-day virtual youth camp, the third time we have done it, right? I love young people. I'm very passionate about young people. I huff and puff after them. When they run, after, run away from me, I chase them down the road, down alleys. I pull them up like a rabbit, you know, with the two years. I love to invest in young lives. That's a passion. So serving faith means whom are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? in achieving for God. Otherwise, you know what will happen? You're going to drift through life. You're just going to drift through life. So why did I pick Hebrews 11 as a scripture reading? Because you know, Hebrews 11 is all about faith. By faith, by faith, by faith. And faith is an action verb. Every time a name is mentioned, there is some exploit that is mentioned alongside of it. By faith, Noah built an ark over 120 years. By faith, Abraham sacrificed his son. By faith, Rahab. By faith, Gideon. And the list just goes on and on. And do you know something very interesting in my opinion? Hebrews chapter 11 is the unfinished chapter in the Bible. Your name and my name can be added to Hebrews 11. By faith, Benjamin. And what would be written after that? Something worth thinking through, and especially in your youth years, because then you have a whole lifetime to be able to do those exploits for God, whatever that exploit is that God is calling you to do. So I want to again challenge you as a church, don't settle for the spectator mentality. Right? Spectator mentality is where you sit, and you watch a performance, and you go home, you applaud. You might put a few bucks into the plate, but personally, you're not involved. You're not doing anything. There is something that God wants you to accomplish, right? And set some small goals first. Next three months, what does God want you to do? Oh, I'm going to sleep in. Oh, I'm going to watch what's the latest on Netflix. Very poor choice. Very poor choice. Right? Yes? Okay, I, I thought you all are an expressive church. Yeah. Right? I am hearing the laughter. You've got to say, yeah. Then I get very excited and I'll preach till 2 p.m. <laughs> Somebody has left a gracious watch here reminding me time is running out. I want to pocket this watch, okay? Goal of faith is saving faith and serving faith. Now, number four, grades of faith. <laughs> At school, you get graded, right? <laughs> so there are grades of faith in the school of faith. I want to highlight three of them. No faith 
<laughs> That's where we all begin. No faith. Mark chapter 4 verse 40, the Lord Jesus looked at his disciples and said this in a storm. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? You've got to underline those two words, no faith. In other words, your faith has hit rock bottom. I have invested in you over these two, three years. And how come you have no faith? So maybe that is where you are on your faith journey this morning. No faith. But then we transition to little faith, to little faith. In the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus addressed the people and said, Oh, you of little faith, can't you trust the Heavenly Father to provide for you? Oh, you of little faith. And uh, again, in a storm, the Lord Jesus rebuked his disciples by saying, you of little faith. He personally rebuked Peter by saying, you of little faith, when Peter attempted to walk on the water. So maybe that's where you are on in your faith journey this morning. Little faith. That's better than no faith. Little faith. But here is the highest grade. The highest grade is great faith. And you know something very interesting? The Lord Jesus complimented two people who were outside the Jewish faith community. They didn't belong to the Jewish faith community. And what a rebuke this would have been to the disciples and to the Jewish community. He highly complimented a Shiro Phoenician woman, a Canaanite, idol worshiper when she came to the Lord Jesus on behalf of her little daughter who was cruelly oppressed by demonic power and she trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for deliverance and the Lord Jesus uh, said woman you have great faith it was a persevering faith it was a faith that refused to take no for an answer isn't that beautiful a faith that refused to take no for an answer. And what a reward she got. And then, of course, there was this Roman uh, centurion, Roman officer, Italian. And he had a servant who was gravely ill and came to the Lord, or at least sent servants to the Lord on behalf of that servant. And that man basically said, Lord Jesus, I'm not worthy to have you under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will get healed. And the Lord Jesus complimented this Roman official as someone who had great faith. So, where are you on your faith journey this morning? No faith? Little faith? Or are you graduating to great faith? Right? So, grades of faith. Now comes, I think, the most important part of this sermon, growth in faith. You can look at me and say, Pastor, I've got your point. But how do I grow in faith? My faith is kind of flickering. My faith is like wavering. There are times there is no faith. There is time a little faith. How can I, how can I mature to, to the great faith stage? Four answers. They all come with the letter E. Okay? Firstly, growth in faith occurs when you're educated by God's word. Have you ever wondered why on a Sunday morning there is a half an hour sermon? The church that I regularly preach at, I preach for 45 minutes. And if they listen very attentively, I go to one hour. I know what you're saying. Thank God I'm not in that church. You know, faith cannot grow apart from the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the message about the Lord Jesus Christ. So the more time you spend with God's word, reading, listening, meditating, obeying, 
to that degree, your faith is going to grow. So one of the questions we love to ask young people is, how is your devotional life? So I want to ask that question. How is your devotional life? Ah, devotional life, ah, the three times a week. Uh, how often, uh, what time do you spend? Ah, five minutes. No wonder your faith is at such a low level. Right? How many times do we eat a day? Minimum three, young people eat five times. How do I know? Because I do youth camps. So Pastor Vittle, we had to have a table filled with food till midnight. I take a team with me just to cook food, to keep hungry lions in the form of teenagers happy with food. Right? And of course we need the physical food, right? Thank God for Tim Hortons. Thank God for Lynn Garden, my favorite Hakka restaurant. Chili chicken and uh, vegetable fried rice. Man, finger licking stuff. Have you been there, brother? You've been there. You'll take me there? Okay, right. It's a deal? Deal. Or oh, the church is the witness. Right. Okay, thank you. So, we love food because, physical food, because it helps us to grow, it helps us to become strong. In the same way, you and I need the word of God daily so that we can become strong in our faith. You know this uh, youth camp that we had virtually? We had young people getting up at 4.30 in the morning in Sri Lanka to follow it. Because they said, we don't have a camp like this, can we join in? 4.30 in the morning. I have a Bible study on uh, Sunday evenings and I have about seven pastors who join in from Sri Lanka and India getting up at 4.30 in the morning. So what's my point? My point is your faith cannot grow if it is not educated by the word of God. But secondly, my faith grows when it is exercised by the trials of life. That's why we have storms. All of us will have our personal storms. We will have family storms. We will have national storms. Sri Lanka is going through a massive national storm, if you have been checking your news. So these trials provide us the opportunity to flex our faith muscles to flex our faith muscles. How are your faith muscles this morning? I go to the gym because it was mandated by my son who looked at me and said, Dad, don't you want to see your grandchild? Go to the gym, work out, be healthy. So one of the things I'm forced to do is to lift weights. And when I see some, I go to the cheap man's gym, fit for less. If you can upgrade it, brother, I'll be happy. Uh, so when I see a known person go past, I take a big weight and lift it up. Right? I like to play some games. But you know, jokes apart, how are your faith muscles this morning? Now look at this verse, 1 Peter 1.7. These trials will show you that your faith is genuine. By the way, trials show whether our faith is shallow, weak, genuine, or fake. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. So next time, embrace your trials whatever that trial is. Embrace it. Why? It's a wonderful opportunity provided by the Lord for you and for me to grow in our faith. Thirdly, we grow in our faith as we are encouraged by the people of God. Encouraged by the people of God. Romans 10, 8, the word of faith, we, in the plural, are proclaiming. Why are we sharing the word of God? So that you can get encouraged. 
I have about 300 names on my WhatsApp. I, I didn't know what WhatsApp is. I'm not a, I'm not a technology guy. And uh, someone said, you know what? You're missing out big time by not being on WhatsApp. And the person showed me what and what could be done through WhatsApp. And I'm absolutely, uh, I'm absolutely amazed. And from different parts of the world, I have the opportunity of encouraging people in their faith by simply going on WhatsApp free and being able to share a word and encourage them to grow. I use uh, emails extensively uh, just to encourage people. So everyone around you is hurting. They are going through some trial. They are going through some pain. Monday to Friday, I call a person 44 years old, just became a dad, and he has been diagnosed with brain tumor cancer. And doctors have said maximum three years. So every night at nine o'clock, around that time, I open up a scripture, read it, encourage him, and pray with him. My new community, community is the grief community. So many in that list now. And I uh, counsel uh, parents who lost their 20 year old daughter, just dropped dead a few months ago. And every Saturday morning, nine o'clock, I spend one hour with them on WhatsApp, just encouraging them to keep going on in the face of a terrible loss they have faced. I, I mean, imagine losing a 20 year old daughter. So our faith grows as we are encouraged by the people of God. When you bump into someone, share a scripture. Share what you read on daily bread. And you never know how the Holy Spirit is going to take that and use it in their life. And then number four, our faith grows when we express it as a request to God in prayer. <laughs> the disciples came on one occasion and said, Lord, increase our faith. So you can make it a personal prayer request. You can make it a church prayer request. Increase our faith. But be prepared for some storms that will come when you pray that prayer. Because there's no other way that your faith, my faith can be increased. So the growth in faith. Now we come to point number six, the grain of faith. <laughs> I love this grain of faith. Matthew 17, the Lord Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, it will move, nothing will be impossible for you. This is what we call mountain moving faith. Of course, not to be taken uh, literally because you can't look at a literal mountain and say, move over, <laughs> uh, that won't happen. But the whole point is, we all have mountainous problems in our lives, personally and as a church, isn't it? We have mountainous problems. Maybe you have a mountainous financial problem. Maybe you have a mountainous health problem. Maybe you have a mountainous relational problem. So problems loom large. They become massive mountains before we know it. And the Lord Jesus is saying to us, it's not big faith that's going to move that mountain. It is small faith in the great God. The object of our faith is what is critically important. It's not the amount of faith. It's the object of our faith, the unshakable God, unchanging God, the person of God. So that's why we uh, study the Bible to uh, study the character of God. Because that encourages us to trust God, even with our little faith. Grain of faith. God, I'm going to trust you to move this massive mountain. Right? <laughs> and watch what God is going to do. Now we come to point number seven, the graduation of faith. <coughs> There is going to come a graduation day. I wonder how many of you took note of the first two songs that we sang. 
it is well with my soul. I'll come to that in a minute. What is the graduation of faith? When faith is turned to sight. Today, everything about the Christian life is by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. But there is going to come a defining day when faith is going to be turned to sight. So look at the two verses. Acts 7, when Stephen was being stoned to death, I see, underline the word see in your Bible. If you have a highlighter, highlight it. I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Graduation day for our first martyr Stephen when literally he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. I love Revelation. I've been doing a lot of reading on Revelation 21 and 22 over these last two years. Uh, after my wife's death, I have read a lot of grief literature books. This is the one that captures me the most. Revelation 22 verse 4. They will see his face, underline the word see. The beatific vision. So when I went uh, to the to the cemetery where my wife is buried, I love to walk around, and there is this twenty-six year old girl who is buried. Christian girl died in a head-on crash on Markham Road. And guess what verse is written on the tombstone? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they and they alone shall see God. Those dear parents had the faith to believe that their daughter Joanna is beholding the face of God. What makes heaven heaven? It's not the streets of gold. It's not the tree of life. It's not the angels. It's the person of God and we are going to see him face to face, to behold his beauty, Psalm 27. Today we behold his uh, beauty by faith, but there is going to come that defining day when we are going to behold his moral beauty and perfections by sight. That's why I love that song. It is well with my soul. I've given you one stanza. Sometimes we sing, but we don't sing. We sing without any real meaning. We don't even check the words of what we are singing. For me now, all the hymns have taken on new meaning. Right now, watch this verse. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. Hasten the day, Lord, when I am no longer required to exercise faith because everything is going to be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trumpet shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. <laughs> and if we are privileged to be alive at that time, we are going to literally see that event with our naked eyes. So, beloved, this morning, before I pray, this school of faith, how are we doing? How are we doing? Where are we? Where are we? Uh, what fine tuning needs to be done so that we can upgrade our faith and bring it to where God wants it to be? Bring it to where God wants it to be. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord that you are the God who grants us the gift of faith, the gift to believe, and then, Lord, it continues right through our life till that defining moment when faith gives way to sight. And today, Lord, as I look at this wonderful congregation, all these young people, 
what amazing potential there is. I pray, Lord, that you would raise up giants of faith who are able to do great exploits for the kingdom of God and that we would not settle for anything less, that we would not settle for a spectator Christianity, but that we would get into the arena where the battle is fought and that we will be scarred in the process. But Lord, we bring glory to your name and we cause the kingdom of God to expand. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.